Good afternoon. Wow, I wish I could do that at home. Um, first of all, I want to uh, let people know to make sure that you picked up a brochure and um, want to thank everybody for coming today. I want to thank all the people who came last year and are returning again this year as we help make this a tradition in our program to uh, attend the Lawler Lecture and bring our community of um, students, academicians, consultants, government employees, and everyone who has been part of this community and EWRE for so long. And those of you who haven't and are just joining the community. It's great to see people coming back. It's great to see our former students. It's great to see every one of you. And for those of you who are here for the first time, we're hoping you're going to be back next year and the year after because this lectureship is really meant for us to bring our community together and to have this opportunity every fall to catch up, see what we're doing, find areas of interest, and communicate. So after the lecture, there'll be a reception, and everyone's welcomed to attend and talk and catch up as you were doing um, before. But I really want to thank all of you. And the last thank you I want to give today is to uh, Des and Alice Lawler for actually coming this year. So really appreciate that. And uh, <laughs> with, with that, I will hand it over to Des to um, say a few words. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, it's just so wonderful to have this you know, broad array of alumni and current students and uh, professionals in the Austin area, and I, I recognize uh, some of you came from far and wide. I think the prize goes to somebody in the audience, a former student of ours who came from Panama. Uh, so Kevin, thanks very much. Uh, that's, that's great. But there's a bunch of you from the Dallas-Fort Worth area and Houston, too, and thanks so much. Uh, I should give you a little background about this, or maybe the question is, how did a lecture series get named after me? Um, so I need to give you a little background. And it, it started by my being uh, uh, invited to give the Professor Feng lecture at the University of Massachusetts about five years ago. He was a professor who started their environmental engineering program about 10 years before the first Earth Day. So he was ahead of his time. And his, uh, his family started an endowment to have a lecture in his honor uh, uh, subsequently. And I was the 30th Feng lecturer, so it's been going on a long time, and uh, it was an honor to be there. And my wife, it was just a great day with, of uh, meeting with students and faculty and having uh, a, a gathering like this of, of alumni and professionals from the community and whatever. And it was just a really great day. And my wife, Alice, accompanied uh, me on that trip, and, and she experienced it as well. So when Bob Gilbert, our department chair, sat down with Alice and me a few years ago and said, you know, we should create some legacy for your time here in our program, and you might think about what that would be. And it was Alice who, having experienced that situation or that, that day in, uh, at UMass, came up with this idea, and, and, and we felt like, OK, this is perfect. You know, it, it, it uh, combines the ideas of a, a strong, deep intellectual pursuit with community building. Uh, so it was her idea, and I thank her for that and for the many great ideas she brought to me uh, that helped the EWRE program and my classroom teaching for many years. So thank you, Alice, who is here somewhere. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> It turns out that to have an endowment that supports this annual event and the annual EWRE fall welcome party, it takes a lot of money. And Alice and I you know, gave a, a nice gift to start that endowment, but we needed a lot more money. So that started my second career, being a fundraiser. Um, and I, I wrote to uh, friends in the uh, consulting community and, and uh, the professional community, 
And I, I asked EWRE faculty and many graduates, starting with my students who did their research with me, but then expanding to others. And it just had an overwhelming response, as indicated by the slides, not this one, but all the others that are on there that show the, you know, about 20 companies or other uh, entities who gave money and about 150 individuals, which is, you know, just truly amazing. And I just can't say thank you enough to all of those people who did that, many of whom are in the room here. And it ensures that this event and the annual EWRE welcome party uh, will happen forever. So long after I'm gone, you can come to the Lola lecture. Um, and I just a brief note, this slide that's on right now up, up here is a, uh, about a, another uh, attempt of the EWRE faculty to interact with the local professional community. And uh, in the reception afterwards, there'll be some flyers that, that have that information on it. So I just want to give a little shout out to that. Okay, we need to get to the main event. Um, and in a second, I'll turn the phone, I mean, the uh, microphone over to, uh, to Professor uh, Naveed Saleh to introduce our speaker. But we all know that that's uh, Dr. Menachem Elamilik, and I just want to give my personal thanks to many for agreeing to come to this, and we really look forward to your lecture. So thank you, and Naveed, the floor is yours to introduce. Thank you, Des. Hello, everybody. Uh, a few days ago, when Des asked me to um, introduce many, many Elimelech, um, I was wondering where should I start, because there is so much to talk about uh, someone like many. Um, one of the first things that, of course, many of you probably think about when you hear many's name is his impact in the field. So, you know, I uh, looked at his Google Scholar page and uh, looked at his H index. Probably you know that it's close to 200. Um, looked at his citations. It's more than 130 odd thousand. And then I looked at the recent citations that many have been getting. It seemed like in nine months this year, he got more citation than my whole career. So I was thinking, OK, if I want to fit a kinetic you know, model with many's trajectory of citation, what would be that rate, and do we actually have such a reaction in environmental engineering? Um, I'm not sure about that. So many is a kind of a physical manifestation of you know, a literal singularity in, in impact, uh, if you will. So you probably have already read the flyer. You know about Menachem Eli Malek, uh, where you know, he came from, where he got his degrees from, all the honors that he has got over the years. Um, you know, you already know this. I don't want to um, reiterate that. But what I can tell you uh, is a personal experience that I had with many. I worked with many. I was very lucky to do so between 2007 and 8 um, as a postdoctoral mentee. And uh, what I learned during the time is that many has this infectious passion for uh, environmental engineering, for water. Um, he has this ability to. Uh, excite a lot of you know, younger generation, um, I was one of them at the time, who can carry on um, his legacy and, and you know, contribute in the field. So many infected me with, with uh, many bug at the time. So many I'm still infected. Uh, so thank you for that. But I don't want to belabor uh, anymore. You all are waiting to hear from him. So all I can say is that um, you know, I am one of the manyites. And I'm proud, I'm a proud one. So thank you for everything you have given me and the field. And today, many is here to honor um, another luminary in our field, Desmond Lawler. And they both interfaced uh, with Charlie O'Melia and uh, shared some experience at Johns Hopkins. So many will tell you more about that. So with that, uh, I will welcome Menachem Eli Molek, uh, who is the Sterling Professor at Yale University. Menachem Eli Molek, the 2023 Lawler Lecturer. Okay, can you hear me now? Good, okay, thank you so much, really, Navid, for the introduction. And I'm very pleased to be here. I mean, I feel a little 
awkward that this is my first time at UT Austin, this great place. So, but anyway, it's nice to be here, especially for a desk loaner. So, so anyway, I was trying to find a few pictures, a few things to say about this, and I thought uh, one of the best pictures here that, that's it. So Des came to Yale, uh, gave a talk in uh, 2005, a uh, seminar in our department, and those of you who are not familiar with Des, I mean, his brother at that time was a professor in English at Yale University. So, I mean, of course, his brother and other brothers came to the talk, and it was really, really a beautiful uh, event and nice to meet with Des. So I know Des for a long time, and again, Everyone thinks that he is a student of Charlie O'Milia, although on paper I think that he was a co Charlie O'Milia was a co-advisor, but we all consider you as a Charlie O'Milia student and you're really part of the family. So, so anyway, there's, a, I mean, as a passion for particles, again, you know it, I mean, he took his physical and chemical processes, and again, and particle hydrodynamics especially, and this is a classic paper that uh, Des was, uh, wrote with Muyan Han, and this paper won the best uh, paper award for the Association of Environmental Engineering and Science professors. So, so, so this is about the hydrodynamics, but also this appreciate thermodynamics, because when he was, was at Yale, again, we always take a scientist to see the grave of Gibbs. Gibbs was on the campus of Yale, you know, buried at the campus of Yale University. And this is this, I mean, next to Delta G. So hydrodynamics and thermodynamics go together to some degree. So now, what's great about this is that, again, this did not go always to work on this sparkly, again, I did not use the other word with S, sparkly papers and sparkly topics. He worked on things that are relevant to practice and did very, very fundamental work to explain things that are relevant to practice, which not many of us are doing, including me sometimes. I mean, I forget about the practical. And again, this is a classic paper relating the other work that I mentioned, all this hydrodynamic around the particles, and apply it to real uh, you know, uh, flocculation or coagulation, whatever you call it. And this is the insignificance of G. I don't know how many of you know G, but this is the velocity gradient uh, design parameter for uh, flocculation that he showed that it's not really as important as we think from uh, practice. And again, I was quite inspired from the relative in this title and Ten, about 10 years later, I wrote a paper with relative insignificance, and it's all because I've seen the paper of, of this. So, but this time, I did not put it in parentheses. I put it just real. And indeed, 20 years later, I wrote another paper, which is even the, added the relative. <laughs> and it's all remembering the paper of, of this. I mean, he was probably the first one who had it. So anyway, so this is really great here to be and deliver the, uh, the lecture for this. And of course, whenever you talk about this, any student here who took physical and chemical processes, I mean, this is the classic book. Again, it's like the Bible in physical and chemical processes, very, very thick, with amazing uh, you know, content and problems. And, and thank you for having this book for our field. It's really very, very important. OK, now, that, done with a few things about this. And now let's talk about the science and engineering. And I would like to talk here, again, although the title was on ion selectivity, I would like to start with the evolution of next, next generation desalination membranes, or even membranes that remove salt, not even desalination. And eventually, the way I see it, again, I would say the modern one in the last 20 years, there was some phase you know, early in the early 2000 until 2014, roughly, about designing membranes with very ultra high flux for desalination, with the purpose to make desalination more efficient. Later, and what we are working also now today, is membranes that rather than having high water flux or water permeability, membrane that has high water salt selectivity, or in other words, ultra high salt rejection, much higher than what we have now in reverse osmosis. And more recently, we are working, and this is the main topic of my talk, on, on membranes that can distinguish between ions and ions that are really relatively very similar. So this will be the framework of my talk, and about the two topics I will talk relatively briefly. So let's start with the first one, ultra-high flux membranes. And again, uh, as material science evolved, there were a lot of exciting materials. And many scientists proposed that we can use these uh, ultra-high uh, materials with a very high water flux. For example, carbon nanotubes can pass water, which would be 10,000 times more than what you calculate from the well-known Hagen-Poise equation for a pipe. Or if you have a single atom graphene sheets there, they will be very, very thin, so you can really produce a lot of water flux. 
And the idea was there that this high flux will really have a quantum leap in desalination. And what they thought, if you have high water permeability, you will need to apply less pressure, and you will save a lot, a lot of energy. So, so again, and, and as usual, whenever you have this kind of excitement, you have all these papers in all these top journals, like uh, Science, Nature, etc. And again, you, even the news media jump into it, and the news media, again, BBC, again, quite uh, respected the thing, and they talk about uh, having desalination with this graphene, for example, with minimal energy input. And again, the more you think about it, if you apply some engineering principle, I would like to show you just simple calculation that although it's an exciting area of research, I admit, I mean, to study the fundamentals of uh, ion and water transport and the effect of the confinement on the properties of water is super exciting. But when it comes to engineering system, it has negligible effect on desalination because when you calculate the energy efficiency, as you see here, specific energy versus water permeability, the current water permeability of desalination membrane is here. And you see that as you go farther, you have minimal impact on energy. And the reason is because the energy consumption will be controlled by the brine of the exit brine from the last module. And it's already very, very high. It's already about, in seawater, 70,000 ppm, which is about 55 bar. And you already need at least energy equivalent to 55 bar. OK, so, and again, we found it, again, from the same paper that I mentioned, that it's universal. When you talk about materials and increasing the energy efficiency, if you take desalination in, by reverse osmosis, I already showed you. But also, there was a technology that was developed uh, earlier, capacitive deionization. And also, we showed that materials will not change the energy uh, outcome. And the same thing with membrane distillation. So it's quite universal. So this was the first part about a high flux membrane, and we show that just by basic simple calculation from engineering principle, you can show that they will not increase the energy efficiency. Let's go now to a work that, and again, this is a very important work, and again, the right thing to increase the water salt selectivity. It's a very, still very active area of research. When you describe desalination as a whole or any membrane performance, you usually present it as a selectivity versus permeability in which experimental data fall roughly here. And we have what we call the permeability selectivity trade-off. We cannot have high water permeability without sacrificing the selectivity. So what I showed you that increasing water permeability will not be efficient, but maybe we need to have ultra high salt rejection. For example, if you have ultra high salt rejection, you will not need to have second pass to remove boron, which is very important in desalination. Or in the ultra pure water industry, if you have membrane with 99.999% rejection, the water, you know, getting water for the, this industry will be quite, uh, you know, high purity water will be quite easy. And again, in this area of research, there are a lot of efforts done here. Uh, and again, roughly the same materials are, are used for these applications. And again, some materials will have some really, uh, uh, you know, future, I mean, uh, to improve such membrane. But I would like to focus on one type of membrane, the graphene membranes. And again, a lot of papers mentioned graphene as a potential way to improve the water salt selectivity after they realized that high water permeability is not relevant or is not the, the goal. Let's have a graphene to use ultra high salt rejection. And again, a lot of publication on graphene and other two dimensional materials. And, and again, the same news from the BBC. Again, this was related to a, a graphene that can sieve ions and get super practically remove all the salt completely. So, so again, what, what eventually, again, I will not go, again, because it's not main uh, part of the talk here, but all the work on graphene completely failed to have performance even close to the thin film composite reverse osmosis membrane. Now, the question why it failed, and again, I will just say a few words about it. So, so first, in my opinion, to design any membrane with high rejection, you need to have a bottom-up approach, molecular design. You need to start from the bottom and then molecularly design the membrane with the right pore size, for example, to get complete rejection of salt. And this was not done in this field because what they've done in this field, they use a top-down approach. They took this graphene with all these graphene sheets with all kinds of shapes and so on, and they thought that they will throw them and put them in some way, they will arrange in the perfect way that you will get complete salt rejection. And it doesn't work this way. And also, of course, whenever you do this kind of thing, also to upscale such membrane is quite complicated, and it would be impossible to upscale such membrane with graphene that even at a very small scale, one centimeter square, 
they were not able to get rejection. They even got close to nanofiltration membrane, just to you know to let, let indicate. So, so again, as I mentioned, scaling up to industrial level will be very, very uh, challenging. And, and, and again, the key here, we need to have a molecular design. So what I would like to show you some work, again, before going to the main topic here that ion-ion selectivity, about some way that, again, not ideal molecular design, but let's look at the basic process of interfacial polymerization, the way we make membranes, and by somehow reg regulating the interfacial polymerization, I can show you you can get membrane with relatively high performance. So I would like now to talk about nanofiltration membrane. We know we use nanofiltration membrane to separate monovalent from divalent ions. And again, the way we make a nanofiltration membrane, we have interfacial polymerization with a trimethyl chloride in an organic solvent and piperazine in a, a water phase. And this process of interfacial polymerization is uncontrolled. It's very fast reaction. And you can get a very thin film that does a, a great job. This is the way you also do with reverse osmosis membrane. But because you cannot control the interfacial polymerization, you get a membrane which you think the nanofiltration, the pores are not uniform, as schematically described here. And what, again, was shown that in principle, if you add some a slight modification to control the interfacial polymerization, for example, in this example, this is a, a process called surfactant assistant regulation of uh, interfacial polymerization. If you add surfactant, the surfactants will uh, you know, <laughs> accumulate at the interface of the organic and aqueous solvent. And by, uh, again, you need to have the right uh, you know, uh, you know, anionic surfactant and the right length. And they will regulate the interfacial polymerization to be a little more controlled. And in principle, you can get a membrane, which here schematically we show, with much more uniform pore sizes. And with these uniform pore sizes, now let's see the performance when you separate monovalent from divalent ions. And here I'll show you the top data is just the typical nanofiltration membrane that you have by interfacial polymerization without the surfactant, which is just very you know, fast and not controlled. And we see this kind of a separation curve. Again, this is rejection versus the Stokes radius of the ions, or, or the, of the solutes here. You see that the uh, monovalents are here, uh, divalents is here, but we don't see any sharp you know, uh, separation. But when you take the membrane that was done by surfactant uh, assistant re uh, regulated IP, we see a very, very sharp separation. So it tells you that, again, although it's not building a membrane for molecular design from the beginning to the end, but just by controlling this process, you can get a membrane with very, very sharp separation performance. So this, again, just to show that you can still use polymeric me membrane, nothing wrong about them, and, uh, and all this graphene, again, Again, it's nice for, to do fundamental research, but when you make a membrane, anything that you do top-down approach will not work well. So you need molecular design. And again, I know here uh, Manish is building molecular design of some artificial channels from, for building blocks, and, and they build them like molecularly, which I think this is the way to, to go there. OK, so, so this was about the two parts. And now I would like to go now about the topic of ion-ion selectivity, which is, again, it's emerging area. Again, it's a area that is now very active, at least academically, and I think it has a lot of potential also for future you know, applications in our field, the environmental engineering and other chemical separations. Okay, so we know that we have ion selective membrane already are used for desalination and water purification in electrodialysis. We have ion exchange membrane that separate between, again, cations and anions, you know, so they are selective to ions of different uh, uh, charge. And the same thing, I already mentioned uh, nanofiltration. Nanofiltration, the purpose is to separate between monovalent and divalent, and it works relatively uh, quite well. So, but again, there is still room here to improve the selectivity here and, and farther in electrodialysis if you want to separate between ions of the same charge. There is a lot of room there also to, to, to work on. And nanofiltration, as I showed you, the current membranes, unless you do some modification, we do not get very, very sharp separation between monovalent and divalent. Now, for the future, again, again, uh, such membranes will play a very important role in the circular economy. You know that we are running out of lithium uh, and many, many other uh, important elements. And if we can design a membrane that can be selective, for example, if you have lithium, and I will mention it later, and lithium is in a cocktail of many other ions, sodium, potassium, magnesium, and we need to find some way to direct lit lithium extraction. You will have only lith lithium going through a membrane, 
and not all the others. And this is, you see later, very challenging because if you look at the periodic table and the properties, lithium, sodium, and potassium, they are the same charge, roughly the same size, and you need something very, very sophisticated. You cannot just do it by simple uh, uh, membrane. And again, you can also think about recycling from a, a lithium ion battery wastewater and uh, electronic waste, and also from our field in wastewater if you want to extract uh, nitrate or, or phosphate. So you need something very, very selective. As I mentioned, uh, you can recover recovering metals from wastewater and brine. Again, you can augment me, uh, metal stocks because we don't have enough uh, of these uh, mines that you can use. And some places, for example, cobalt is now becoming very, very important for renewable energy devices. And most of the Congo is in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which a lot of issues there. There are many uh, child abuse, you know, very little uh, children that are working there and working day and night and so on. And one way is really to recover them from wastewater. So this is just for an example here. You can also recover metals from uh, mine wastewater tailings. Again, there are plenty of metals there, and you can find a very selective process that you can have direct extraction of the ions that you need. It will be great. Because nowadays, it takes, I mean, the other techniques that you're using, precipitation and so on, they are not very sustainable. So we all know about this, uh, uh, the lithium triangle. Again, for Brian, this is in the, on the border or in between uh, Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile. They have a lot of these salt lakes with huge quantities of, of, of brine salty water. And currently, to extract lithium, it's a very, very long process. You need to do evaporation for months and then precipitation of salt and many, many other processing. So it can take two years, almost two years, 22 to 24 months, to extract lithium. So we need to have something that will replace these kind of old processes. And it all leads to some need for very, very selective membranes. Again, the Department of Energy recognized the, the importance of this recovering of minerals. And again, this is from last year, but I think since then there were many other calls. DOE announced 39 million uh, for technology to grow the domestic critical minerals supply chain and strengthen national security. So again, extracting and recovering these uh, uh, you know, critical elements is really of national security, very, very important. And so now the question is always, uh, what, I mean, from where we should extract? Again, there is a plenty of research. In academic research, we just do things that are interesting, but sometimes claim that, you know, we can recover, for example, you know, lithium from the ocean and so on. But we need to have some analysis to see when it's viable or not. So, so again, as I indicated here, substantial research to develop technologies for binding metals from wastewater and brines. However, there is little guidance about what metals may be technologically and economically recovered. And we have done some recent analysis in a paper just a few uh, earlier this year of prospects of metal recovery from wastewater and brine, which we, again, it was a prospective article, uh, did some uh, uh, techno-economical analysis and see where it's valuable to extract. And again, it's very important because many of you know that people even wanted to rec uh, extract gold from the ocean or uranium from the ocean, will it be economical? And our analysis was quite simple, that the conclusion is that all these critical elements, except calcium, magnesium, and sodium, all these critical elements, you need to target industrial wastewaters. If you go to any natural waters, and here, natural waters, I also include seawater, uh, brine from seawater desalination plant, brackish ground water, and, and, and so on. So this simply will not be economical. You need to process so much water, and the cost will be very, very large. And again, this is the reason why we are not extracting gold from the ocean and not extracting you know, uranium from the ocean. And those of you who are chemical engineers, good chemical engineers, you know the Sherwood plot. Again, the, again, the lower the concentration of the elements in the solution, the more expensive it is to, re to recover. And simply for all these brines from natural sources, the lithium concentration is very, very low, including all the other elements that are important you know, for the electronic industry and renewable energy. So just sodium, but again, sodium, but then you cannot make a lot of money. Again, there are a lot of people from companies here from sodium, maybe magnesium, and so on. So, so this was, I think it's an important conclusion, and I think we need to direct the, at least the research to the right water source. Okay. Now let's talk about the types and difficulty of ion separations. So. So in principle, 
you know, ions of opposite charge is relatively easy to separate, and we do it by ion exchange membrane. We have a cation exchange membrane, anion exchange membrane, and if you put them in electrodialysis, it works relatively well. We get to, you know, relatively decent term selectivity. It de will deteriorate when you have high salt concentration, but it's important, you, can, you need to improve it, but it's not super challenging. If you have members of different valency, it become a little more challenging, but again, also doable to some degree, and uh, we have a nanofiltration membrane that can do it to some degree, not ideally, as I showed you earlier. There is also the industry develop a monovalent selective uh, ED that will let a monovalent go through and reject a divalent, and it's done to some degree. And then, the, really, the holy grail is really to separate ions of the same charge and size for like lithium and sodium. This is very, very challenging. And when you talk about the, the increasing difficulty, it goes in this direction. These are relatively done, but to separate, again, we have no membrane nowadays, at least commercial one, that can separate between lithium and sodium effectively. So, so this is really the challenge, and, and my talk will focus on these same charge size ions. So current membranes cannot do this job of separating ions of similar charge, because they are based on the relatively simple mechanism. Again, they're based on size exclusion, but the way we make membrane nowadays, polymeric membrane, you cannot get membranes with very, very uniform pore size at the size of, the, of ions. You can do it maybe for ultrafiltration, but the size of salt separation, it's hard to make it. There's always distribution, and you know that polymers are, are fluctuating in thermal motion, and the pore size will not be uniform. And the other mechanism is charged, but it's not good enough to separate lithium for sodium. This I'll give you the example. So we need to have a more sophisticated way, and this is where we get to this biological channel. We go to nature and evolution of how many years? I don't know, over a billion, few billions of years. We we're able to develop the potassium channel, which is the best selective channel that you can ever find in the world. And this potassium channel in our body or plants can separate between potassium and sodium by selectivity of close to 10,000. For each 10,000 potassium ion that go through, only one sodium will go through. Imagine. And again, it's just evolution of uh, uh, billions of years. And the way it works, if you have the potassium here, the, the, the filter, filtration channel here is very, very narrow. It's only 1.2 nanometer, very narrow, uh, very thin. And the potassium to enter, again, it's also very narrow in, in, in size here. The potassium to get in need to dehydrate, to shed the water molecules, but then it's become unstable, so we need to find some way to compensate for the dehydration, and we have the right functional groups here in the potassium channel in which the potassium binds, and it, now it feels good because it has something that, that compensates for the dehydration, for the, the fact that it doesn't have any water molecules, and then it passes here through the channel by uh, jumping from one to the side, and the sodium, because it doesn't fit here, it just cannot fit here because only the potassium can fit here. The sodium is smaller in size, but because it's already very selective to the potassium, the sodium cannot go. So you can get selectivity of over 1,000, which is quite amazing, I mean, from any point of view, and it works very, very well. And based on this one, again, we set the, based on the principles of the potassium channel, we say, what are, if we want to design a synthetic membrane, what are the, uh, the guiding principles? So we can have, again, we summarize the following. The first mechanism, dehydration. You need to have a uniform pore size, but the pore size should be very, very small, uh, but not too small, because we want the dehydrated ions to get through the pore. So if it's too small, it will not go through. So very small, but the right size, so you will still be able to go. We need to have binding site that compensate for the fact of, that you have dehydration. Because the potassium channel, again, you dehydrate, you shed all the water molecules, but once you get here and bind to these oxygen-containing groups there, you f energetically you feel favorable, so we need to have the right binding site. We need to have a thin layers, because if it's very, very thick, it will be very, very low you know, transport rate. We need to have it fast, but then it cannot be super, super, super thin, because then maybe you will not be selective. So you need to have the right opti uh, optimal, and in this case, it's only 1.2 nanometer, which is very, very difficult to you know, create by any, uh, you know, nowadays by synthetically. And then the narrow spacing, because there is a knock-on effect. When you have two ions close to each other, because the potassium positive, they will push the other one, and this one push the other one, and it enhances the transport. And this is what evolution of one billion a year does. And now our challenge is really how we can do something even close to this one. It's a very, very, very 
uh, challenging. So I would like to show you just a few thoughts about it. And so I would like to show you uh, 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 some work that we have done, again, not even close to the potassium channel, but just to introduce the principles of uh, binding sites and jumping from site to site. And here we did a very simple membrane just by layer by layer in which we took a cationic polyelectrolyte and anionic polyelectrolyte here, the pH, and we create this anionic polyelectrolyte by reacting PAH with a chloroacetic acid, and we create an anionic polyelectrolyte with aminodiacetate group. This is aminodiacetate, which is very, very selective to divalent cations. It can complex and bind to them. And again, we have alternating layers. Again, this will not be the ideal membrane, but just for studying this concept, we thought it's a good way to start. And I would like to show you some data of uh, removing of these uh, divalent cations and explain the mechanisms, uh, what's going on there. So, okay, so, so let's start. We chose a, a wide range of divalent cations. Again, magnesium, uh, zinc, cobalt, nickel, and, and copper. And look at the properties. Again, look at the axis here. It doesn't start from zero. They have roughly comparable hydration energy. So they are similar in hydration energy. And look at the size here of the ionic radius from 0.6 to 0.8. Roughly, I mean, not much different in size. And we said, okay, now let's see if we can use this principle that I showed you earlier with this uh, selective group that you have them here and see if we can demonstrate this principle of uh, jumping and, and, and selectivity. So, okay. So first we measured the binding, uh, we uh, calculated by DFT the binding uh, constant of the copper to this aminodiacetate group. A, a, a copper, nickel, all these metals. We see copper bind very, very strongly. This is the binding energy. And the others, less. But again, there is some you know, appreciable binding energy. And magnesium as the least binding energy. And when we compare these values from DFT to a, you know, stability constant just from the literature, roughly we got things that are comparable. So the same trend. So now we have a, a immunodiacetate group and, and ions that have different binding energy, and I wanted to study now their transport and selectivity. Okay, so now let's demonstrate the uh, transport, uh, uh, demonstrate the selective transport of copper and magnesium. So again, copper and magnesium, to remind you, they were to the other extreme. One of them here, the highest binding energy, and this one is the lowest binding energy. And let's see if we can apply these principles of binding to selectivity. Okay, so these are roughly the same size, but a huge difference in the binding energy. And we do the typical experiments that you do with the diffusion cell. We have the feed water here. I think I forgot the concentration. Maybe it was 0.1 molar, I think. And we did it at a low pH, so it will be all uh, ionized, uh, around three, uh, pH, low pH. And we have the membrane that we synthesize here, and this is the receiving side. And then you measure the transport of uh, ions from this side to the other here. So the first, just to see what's going on, we studied the transport of single salt. What would be the transport of just magnesium chloride and another experiment, just co uh, copper chloride? And when you study here, we get things that we expect intuitively. If you have uh, the concentration versus time, so this, the slope will be the flux, copper binds very, very strongly to this amino acid, so it slows down. Again, if you think about, uh, theoretically, you have friction, and friction, you know, the, the interaction is more like a friction if you generalize it, and it's, it's, it's flowing, the rate is much, much more than, uh, less than magnesium because magnesium doesn't interact strongly and can have a higher rate. Now, this is single salt experiments, but all application for selectivity we need to have when both of them are together. So what's happened with both of them are together? And this is what I'm going to, to show you now to address it. So let's see what we expect, I mean, conceptually. So we expected, again, two scenario. If the copper here will be red and the magnesium will be blue. So if one way we call it, one way, site inactivation. If the binding of the copper is very, very, very strong, then it will stay there and it will inactivate all the sites. So once you saturate all the sites, the, the re remaining uh, copper and, and magnesium will pass here and you will not see any selectivity. So this was one way. The other way that we hope, if we have what's happening, in, like the principles of the potassium channel, as you see here, if the principles of the potassium channel are indeed correct, so what we expected here, that you will have the magnesium, sorry, the copper 
binding here and jumping from side to side, like the potassium channel. And then the magnesium will not be able to get here because this is already occupied by the, by the copper. And in this way, we can expect here very low selectivity, if not any. And here we expect very, very high selectivity. So I would like now to show you some experiment to see that if indeed we got this kind of behavior. And let's just show you first the single salt experiment. These are the single salt experiments, each one of them separately. So then you cannot define any selectivity here. You can define what we call ideal selectivity, but it doesn't make any sense because selectivity when both of them are the same solution. So here now we go when we have both of them together, the same concentration, 0.1 molar, each one. So we have now 0.2 molar of salt. And indeed, we see an amazing. We see here that no magnesium, almost no magnesium. It was very, very low detection limit. Magnesium was not able to, to go through. And copper moved very, very fast. You see, this trend completely changed. And we can get selectivity of six, over 60, which indicate that probably this you know, binding and hopping from side to side, the way we, we hypothesize here, is valid to some degree. And this is why we get such selectivity. Again, it's, it's not very challenging like the lithium and, so, and sodium, and copper is a little easier. But again, it's quite, quite exciting. Now, again, I think, in, again, this membrane was just to demonstrate the concept. I mean, if you will create such membrane, I will not have the layer by layer membrane. I will have a more you know, sophisticated membrane. And also, in my opinion, we're very challenging to get super, super, super high selectivity because polymers are very dynamic. So again, the pore size. Again, remember, the pore size is also very important for the uh, selectivity. So polymeric membrane will have eventually a limit how much selectivity you can get because it's not a fixed pore size. It's very dynamic you know, thermal motion of the polymers and so on. But it's quite exciting here that we got this kind of behavior for, for uh, copper and magnesium. Now let's see what's happening uh, uh, generally. So again, let's go at the binding energy difference. And again, we think this, this binding energy difference really play a very important role in this uh, selectivity, uh, and I will show you very soon. And what we'll see very soon, that the larger the binding energy difference between the ions that you need to separate, the more selective they will be. And OK, so here we calculated the selectivity between, again, copper and magnesium. This is the data I showed you earlier. Again, this is a different way we define selectivity, but the details are not as important. And here, copper and cobalt. Uh, copper and zinc, and copper and nickel. And, we, and, and, and on this axis will be the binding energy difference that you can get from here. Just for example, in copper and nickel, I just subtract this value from the value that you see here. And you see that we get a relatively good correlation, again, between the uh, selectivity and the binding energy difference. So again, it tells you that uh, the binding energy or the analogy to the potassium channel, although again, I be humble that we will we will never be able to be as good as the potassium channel. But there are some principles here that work very, very well. And if you can apply them in the future to maybe not polymeric member or find a way to limit the motion of the polymer or, or, or something with very, very narrow pore size, like, I don't know, MOF and all these kind of materials, we can get very, very high selectivity that beyond what we can get here. So OK, so, so now, let's see further. We wanted to see what's the effect of the thickness of the membrane. So we did experiments with selectivity. Here we just show you an example of copper and cobalt. And then did the experiments of mixture of the two salts and, and created membrane of different thickness and calculated the selectivity versus the thickness. And we see a very nice trend that the thinner the membrane as you go in this direction, the higher the selectivity. And again, if you want to put everything in perspective, the sub nanometer, if you think about the potassium channel, is going to be in this range, and ion exchange membrane will be in this range. So again, it tells you if you have thick membranes, like ion exchange membrane, probably you will not be as selective. Uh, if we have impossible, and you need to have very thinner. So the, so, so the question is why we get this selectivity. Again, I wanted to skip some slides and not elaborate, but I'll tell you in essence, we also measured the flux of of uh, copper and the flux of cobalt when we have a, an experiment with, with a mixture and saw that the flux of copper changed with the thickness because copper can bind very easily to the top of the membrane. It can have very good sorption or partitioning. And then you move through the membrane. 
So the copper show the same dependence on the thickness, but the cobalt, <coughs> because the cobalt will be partition limited, because the, the copper is already partitioning there, the cobalt cannot find a way to partition, and we found that the flux of the cobalt, when you have a mixture of this salt, doesn't change with thickness. So when you calculate the, thickness, the flux of copper, which change with thickness, verse divided by the flux of the cobalt, which doesn't change with thickness, we get this behavior here. So again, the idea of partition selectivity, I mean, is very, very important, or, or sorption selectivity, and this illustrates this concept. So again, we conclude that membranes which utilize competitive binding effects <coughs> for selectivity may need to be thin, and this is why probably it will not be valuable to create such a membrane. Let's say if you try, take ion exchange membrane and try to tune it with a, a functional group that will follow these principles of hopping will not be very effective. So we need to have the membrane very, very thin, but the problem is always the thinner you get, the more defects you get, and upscaling anything that is very, very thin is very, very challenging. This is why all these next generation materials failed to move beyond this one centimeter square because of the defect that you get when you're very thin. So now I would like to go back to this one and show you just a few things what we are doing now with not real result but just a concept. And again, we try to find, again, what are the rules for selectivity? So we do some experiment, I demonstrated it, but what should I do? I mean, what will be the distance between the functional groups? What's the role of the pore size? What's the role of binding energy? So, so we are doing now more a systematic study and collaborating. We are part of the CENT. It's another EFRC like the MWET. And again, Narayana Luru is uh, here from UT Austin. He's a member of CENT here. And we are trying to develop the rules of selectivity. And what we have done for the, this molecular dynamic simulation, we use a system that is made of uh, one-layer graphene that you stack them. You stack the graphene, and again, graphene is very, very well defined in the thickness, so whenever you stack them, you can control the thickness very well. This is, of course, in molecular dynamic simulations. And, and by this way, we can control the thickness. Uh, we can also control the chemistry. We can decorate the functional groups here. And we can control the pore size and many other properties here. So specifically, we control the pore length. We could just stack more graphene. We control the distance between the functional groups by functionalizing the Again, they, again, we drill, again, molecular simulation, you have a hole that going the, through these uh, graphene sheets that you see here. We can decorate the chemistry rel relatively easy. And again, graphene, we already have all the force fields, and again, it's well known, so it's not that you need to develop a, a molecular dynamic simulation from scratch. We, we measure the, again, the difference of the uh, pore size, affinity, here we can tune the affinity of the two ions, the difference of the binding energy. Uh, we also include a, a, a solvation energy, and this involves a lot, a lot of experiments. Again, we started it uh, about eight months ago, and we're still collecting some data, but the goal is really to collect a lot, a lot of data and eventually use machine learning to extract, eventually to find all the rules, you know, because if you do it just systematically, all of this, it will take you probably three years to do all these molecular dynamic simulations. And again, we will, as you see here, we will have the uh, diameter, length, hydration energy, all these properties that we mentioned here. And eventually we can get the energy, uh, as soon as I will refer to it, of the uh, energy barrier for sorption, energy barrier for diffusion, and energy barrier to exit the pore. And let's see what's going on. For example, uh, so, oh, and I did not mention the most important here. We do here more like umbrella sampling. It's a very common technique in molecular dynamic simulation in which you drag the ions and then you sample all the interaction and you find the interaction profile that you have there, the energy barrier for, for, the, for the ion as it's dragged through the pore. And let's see what kind of thing here. And again, it's conceptual because we did not analyze yet the data. We're still collecting the data. But we can envision something of this nature again. We can envision a case in which Again, we can define here the energy barrier that you can calculate from this uh, simulation for a wide range of length, pore size, etc. And this energy barrier will tell you just the energy that needed to overcome it so you can enter the pore. We call it sorption. And once you have this energy barrier, you can have the time scale or the rate but based on transition state theory is just proportional to the exponential of the, this energy barrier that you see here that you can calculate. And once you have this time scale or the rate, 
We can just calculate the selectivity. For example, we can calculate the time scale for sodium sorption and then time scale for lithium sorption and find the ratio and you can read the selectivity. So this will, for example, you do it for uh, entering the pore, which is very important. And entering the pore, again, you need to have the right chemistry to attract the ion to the right place. If you don't have the right chemistry, probably you will not have this uh, strong sorption, but you will have high energy barrier. We can also have the energy barrier for diffusion inside the pore. And in this case, you see the very large energy barrier. And in our simulation, we've shown that once you have uh, many functional groups, depends on the spacing, eventually you lower this energy barrier because they start to overlap. And overall, you need result in a much, much lower energy barrier. So again, this is why again, the evolution and the biological channel, they put them very, very, very closely spaced. So this is the energy barrier for diffusion. And we can calculate, again, the rate and, and, and again, selectivity and so on. So this is uh, for diffusion. And the thing that we do not think about it, but again, you need eventually for the ion to exit. So you can define energy barrier to exit the, the, ch the, the channel. And we can also calculate it from our you know, umbrella sampling technique that I mentioned earlier. So once we calculate all these energy barrier, we can define, for example, in this case, if you have a situation like this, this is what will be ion transport through this pore will be diffusion limited because the energy barrier for diffusion is very, very large. So the rate controlling step will be this diffusion. So this is one example. Again, it's greater than sorption, greater than the exit. And again, our, eventually with all this simulation, again, we want to define, again, the regime uh, for uh, transport. Uh, we want to define when it will be sorption limited and what are the conditions to uh, prevent it when it will be diffusion limited, and then when it will be exit limited. Exit limited, again, sounds like, like strange to some degree, but when it comes to ion, we need to account for this exit energy from the pore. So, the, so here what I say, how should we, the goal is, how should pores be designed to reduce, a, 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 limit, reduce limiting transport energy barrier and maximum, maximize ion permeability and selectivity? So, so the last slide that I will show you here, Again, this is our goal, as I mentioned earlier, with all these many, many, many simulations. I think now we are close to 500 simulations. Again, it's a long time. And this work was done mostly by uh, my postdoc, Mossi, which was a student of uh, Aluru at uh, Narayana Aluru at the University of Illinois, and is now a faculty in uh, mechanical engineering at uh, NC State. So, so again, you define all, all these energies. And eventually, we need to create such a diagram that tell you, again, what would be the selectivity versus permeability with this role. Again, for example, we have shown that uh, to increase the permeability, we need to have many, many space size. So again, you can increase permeability, but again, the selectivity may not be high. The same thing here, if you take just one layer, you'll be very, very selective, but probably the permeability will not high. And roughly, I mean, ideally, maybe this will be the case, but the purpose is really first to develop the rules and these rules will guide experiments. And we are doing like this experiment that I showed you here. We are part of the uh, Center for Enhanced Nanofluidic Transport, like the, our uh, EFRC, the equivalent of M MWET that you have here. And for example, we are working in collaboration with a, a group from UC Irvine, uh, Professor Zewi and Javier there. And we stack uh, graphene, and we maybe alternate and be graphene and, and we'll leave them uh, MOS2. And drill a hole, they have a technique to drill a hole there very, very well, and try to find even a way to experimentally verify it. So hopefully, once we develop all these rules, again, we can design the right experiment and be able to understand much better this ion selectivity and see if we can design membrane like this. So this brings me to the conclusions. So again, the first part, I showed you that top-down approaches using nanoscale building blocks, if you already take the existing building blocks, it will be futile and probably impossible to find a way to throw them. Like, for example, in graphene, what they do, they just take graphene flakes and then vacuum filter them, and they create a membrane. And they hope that the water will go and they are between these stacked layers in such a way they will have the right spacing to get the rejection of the salt. This will be impossible, and it's doomed to fail. And although some paper will show 90% rejection, you will never be able to do anything like this. The second one is selectivity. Again, what I showed you, the concept of selectivity, if you have identical cations, cations, so 
if you use coordination chemistry or tune the affinity and have the right affinity, you can maybe mimic the principles of the potassium channel. And again, I emphasize our experimental system was not ideal. We just demonstrate the concept. You can make a memory which was much more sophisticated and higher selectivity. And lastly, selectivity between similar species can be engineered by increasing the binding energy difference. If the binding energy will be similar, you will not be able to achieve selectivity. You need to have high binding energy difference, but then eventually you need to worry. Again, if it's too strong, it maybe will not be able to, to come out, and then we need to consider all these exit energy barriers and so on. And this is what we're trying to learn from the molecular dynamic simulations. So this brings me to the end. And again, it was a pleasure to be here and again to be in honor of uh, Dennis Lawler. And I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, the students who did all the work. And again, we have, we have ocean in New Haven, Connecticut, so people don't, we have, <laughs> although it's in the south, <laughs> so even though it's the East Coast. Uh, funded by CENT, it's the Center for Enhanced Nanofluidic Transport, by NEWT, again, it's uh, ERC, and by NSF. And thank you for your time and attention. I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay, many, uh, Manish Kumar, you know me. Uh, so I have a question about the how we would make these ion ion separation systems, right? So the driving force, because we can't use pressure, perhaps we can't use concentration gradient. What is a good balance, you think, in building a device around ion ion selective membranes? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, we, we do all the experiments, at least fundamentally, just doing a diffusion uh, cell, which will be concentration but this will never be applicable to real world operation. And also we are doing now some work eventually to apply electric field by electrodialysis or we take a, some ion exchange membrane and modify them by very, very thin film with all this chemistry. And then we hope that the electric field will increase the rate. We don't know yet how it will affect the selectivity and this is an area that also we study fundamentally. But just by diffusion, it will not be economical in my opinion. It's just too slow and, and not. fundamentally it's, a, the way you study. Uh, thank you. Um, I was pretty intrigued by the mixed uh, results between when you had both cop, uh, copper and magnesium. So I can see magnesium is pretty flat, but the slope for copper is much higher, which tells me, I don't know, why would copper's transport be enhanced? when you had magnesium. Good, you have a good eye, yes. I'll show you if I get to it, yeah. This part of the fundamental of uh, transport. Uh, see here again, you had a good eye. The slope is twice as much. So do you have any idea why? Because here we use, for this experiment, just each experiment 0.1 molar of each salt. Now we have both of them, so we have 0.1 molar of magnesium chloride and 0.1 molar of uh, copper chloride. And the rate limiting step, what control is the chloride. Now we have twice as much chloride. So the rate limiting step is chloride. And we have done the same thing with the reverse osmosis when we develop a model for transport. What control the transport is the co-ions. They are the rate limiting step. Good eye, I mean, I mean, I <laughs> so usually people don't, don't pay attention. So the chloride, the co-ions control the rate eventually. We have twice as much here. Hi, question. Uh, so whenever the chloride eventually comes through, like with, uh, near the end of the experiment, why doesn't the magnesium then increase? Because if, if it's the copper that's blocking the magnesium from going through the... So, so, so why the magnesium increase? Uh, near the end of the... Because if it's the copper that's blocking the magnesium near, uh, during the experiment, why doesn't it then increase near the end of the experiment for the multi-salt? Here? So what, what do you mean increase? It's, it's always very, very low. It, it doesn't change the concentration. So the, here is just barely we can find anything. So when you say increase, can you be more specific? Uh, increase in concentration, like as time goes on, why doesn't it, if most of the copper is already through, like already through the No, no, we, we have a, the reservoirs are, have a lot of ions there, so I don't think there's any depletion of the reservoirs. Oh. So it's just, practically it's a steady state for this time of the experiment. Steady state and you have constant flux of each one of them.
uh, given the complexity of uh, what you're talking about, what's your sense of when you might reach a breakthrough? Uh, how long from present time will we actually potentially have something that could do this? I I, how, do you find, how do you define breakthrough? <laughs> like the potassium yeah. channel, we need another a million, a billion years. years? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think we are getting a lot of love understanding. It's the, the field is just in the it's infa infancy, but a lot of people work in this area. I think it's, it's very, very important. So we understand the principles and so on. I think the challenge would be that you have a practical system in which the rates are high, economically high enough to, to apply. And this is what we want to study when you have an electric field, which we think will be, you know, by electromigration, it could be much faster. But the knowledge is accumulated, and eventually we need to see if it will be economically in terms of rates again. The other alternative, all these selective group, in principle, you can also design very selective, uh, you know, beads or particle and use them by, for adsorption. You know, like you have adsorption membranes and so on, or and so on. So you can have selective. So, so I think the field here, if it's, the rates are not high enough, still the knowledge can be used for des designing a much better selective, you know, adsorb adsorbent. Thing. I have a question. So. Um, have you done the same experiment with a different anion, such as nitrate, that complexes a little less with copper? No, we have done, here, no, we have not done anything like this yet. I mean, for the, oh, still focusing on the cations, but do it with different anions, like not chloride? Right, because copper chloride forms complexes more so than magnesium yeah, chloride. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you've thought about that. In no, in this case, we dropped the pH, we did the experiment at very low pH, so there would be no complexes, just pure copper 2 plus and now, I'm not sure when you have nitrate, what, what pH in here the, the complexes, but here we do not have any complexes for sure. But the copper will still complex with chloride even at low pH, right? Yeah, we use some software to calculate and the fraction is so low that we thought Very it's low. not insignificant. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so if there's, oh, yeah, there, there's oh, one. oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so when you talked about uh, increasing the binding energy being the key to, to better selectivity, right? Yeah. How would you increase it other than changing the functional group? It, it, this is the only way. If, once you have a certain ion, it's just finding the right group. And again, you need to do this kind of, uh, you can do some kind of mod the same way discovery that done in a drug, the drug field that you do a lot of simulation, machine learning, et cetera, and find the base functional groups. But it's only through the functional group, at least what I what I aware of. So you're looking for the perfect one. You prefer one, yeah. So so this amino acid that again it was shown in the literature, it's binding very strongly, so we took it, but there is a lot of room for improving it. And we are working on, on it. For example, we have some work to separate a cobalt from nickel and we are looking for some other kind of functional group and using some a crystal crystal field theory to try to understand it better, yeah. Okay, so I'd like to give uh, all of us a, another round of applause and thank our speaker and <laughs> So at this point, there is a reception right outside the door almost. And, um, and please enjoy, have a chance to talk and enjoy the food and drink. And thanks again for coming. Thanks to all the People returning, it's so great to see everyone. Thanks, Manny, for an awesome talk.